Today, the, oh, is this not on? It's on, right? Yeah. Yeah. Today, we are going to talk about how to solve your own crime that you did, the art of debugging. So, the reason why I chose this topic was uh, I was kind of walking uh, along from lunch one day with our developers and just asking them, uh, they have been in the reverse for six months plus. And we, I asked them, like, hey, what is the most important thing you learned uh, when you started developing? So there's a few things, right? Yes, there's a few things. Yeah, but we, like, I think one of the things that we listed that was uh, very key was how to debug. And I thought that it's actually very important as well because you don't want to annoy your seniors with um, uh, errors, like, help me! But, and then your seniors like, why, what's the problem? It's like, I don't know. <laughs> you don't want that to happen. You have to do your own due diligence on why you created this problem in the first place. So just to introduce ourselves, um, I'm Shiling. I've been coding since uh, jQuery. Uh, that means for eight plus years already. And uh, this is uh, Jiaming, whose day job is our software engineer, but today's his job is my teaching assistant. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so why do you need to learn debugging? First of all, as I mentioned, to be a better teammate. You don't want to go up to someone and say like, okay, there's a problem, help me fix it. It's like nobody wants to help you if you don't try to learn about it yourself. So it's always very good to uh, investigate the problem first and find out what's happening and you present the answers like, okay, I've tried this, tried this, tried this, tried this, and I still don't know what you have done. So at least you should prove to yourself that, okay, I'm a competi uh, competent uh, engineer. I did my homework and uh, people will enjoy working with you because you, you do your, uh, properly do your work. Now, the second thing is you also learn to be a better programmer. Girls, surprisingly, I actually learned more from reverse engineering um, bad code that I wrote and that other people wrote than actually just writing perfect code from the start. Nobody actually starts that way. Yeah. So I, oh, another thing as well is sometimes you actually find out that it's not your fault. It's actually a third party's fault. So you have to, after, by doing this, you'll find out like, which are the bad eggs that you should never touch ever again and yeah so that's how so so there is a proper uh, technique to debugging and it's not googling yes. <laughs> and it's oh, okay and it's not system operating line or doing the console.log anyway that is not a proper way of debugging so what happens is that there's actually a certain set of rules when coming to debugging as i see that on the slides uh, on the screen as you, right now the first side is if definitely to work out on what is actually working and what is not working. If you're unable to identify that type of problem, there's no way that you can debug what's the actual cause of this particular issue. All right? So once that you know that, hey, this particular code of mine and is working and others is not, you are able to identify the problem. So what's next is that you have to simplify it. We have to make sure that this particular, let's say that you have a huge function, you are able to break it down such that it becomes a simpler problem that you can tackle it part by part and not just consume everything at one go by spamming a lot of system operating line or console.log into it. That's not the right way. All right. So after you have simplified everything already, the third step naturally, come down to a conclusion of what are the hypotheses that you can derive from it. All right. So examples like, hey, maybe this particular add function is the one that is causing the issue. So maintain the, maintaining, there are a lot of factors or a lot of parameters within the particular functions. So what you need to do is that to ensure that your hypothesis is right on the dot, like shooting a dart onto a dartboard. You have to ensure that all the other factors, such as the dynamic variables, are stay consistent throughout your test cases. And then after that, to figure out the identify, basically to identify whether the main problem is within what you have simplified in the second step. All right. So fourth is what I hate most, which is creating test units. But you have to because. What this does is that you are able to reproduce your bug um, consistently, all right, and not just hum tam anyhow press. The word hum tam means uh, anyhow, okay. So you cannot you cannot just anyhow rely on your instincts and try it out. Create test cases so that what you deduce is reliable and consistent, all right. So fix number five definitely will be fixing the bug. Once you identify a test cases, you know that hey, this bug definitely occurs within my program, all right. It's time to fix it. So having test units over at your uh, over at step four can help you ensure that on the six on the sixth step whereby you rerun the test again, this can ensure that the bugs is actually fixed and there's a consistency within it. 
right? And seven, last but not least, definitely to document your work, which I, uh, I'm a criminal on it. <laughs> yes, uh, of all the things. Yes, uh, but that's not all. <laughs> People do not know how to read test cases. <laughs> but yes, yeah. So yes. <laughs> but at least, even though it's not well designed, it works. That's the important thing. Nah, I'm just joking. All right. So yes, these are the seven steps of how to debug your particular pro problem efficiently. All right. So moving on next, what we have is that we are going to talk about the front end, front end debugging as well as the back end debugging. Uh, Shilling will be covering on the front end, but I will be the back end. Yeah. So um, there's a lot of things you can do to to break the front end, and you want to make sure that you know how what are the resources you have to debug the front end. So we want to do cover three things today: uh, HTML, CSS, how to debug JS, and how to look at your network logs itself. And it basically breaks down to like this. Uh, I'm gonna just quickly cover all of this, and we're just gonna do a quick demo using the Chrome debugger. Yeah. <coughs> Okay, so I'm gonna try debugging the UIlicious uh, web page itself, and I hope you guys can see uh, what's over here. Otherwise, I'll zoom in one more time. Big enough? Just squint, or maybe lean forward, or watch the video afterwards. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the first few things you wanna do when you set up uh, debugging on the uh, front end, uh, by the way, you, you can just write to, you should open your developer tools. So you can inspect open developer tools or you can just uh, use your shortcut, which I have used over here. So one of the first things that you should do when you open up your debugger and when you have a bug is actually you should disable cache because you don't want to be loading uh, old code that is, has been cached. And that's one of the first few mistakes that a lot of people make. Like they, they are looking at old code and it's like, why is this bug over here actually? It's because they are looking at the wrong set of code. So disable your cache first, make sure that you are loading a fresh set of code. <coughs> okay? So one of the hardest things to, to get right is CSS. So I'm just gonna go into how do you uh, look at your CSS and figure out what, what the hell is going on. So let's take a look at this uh, save button for example. And I think a lot of things that people don't uh, realize is how do I um, how do I inspect uh, CSS when I need to hover it and see what the style is. So there's actually some people will just hover and say, "Eh, hover, <laughs> eh, it's gone. They cannot inspect it." So wh what you should do? There's this magic trick over here. You can click on this uh, colon hove to to trigger some of these pseudo class. So you can see that, hey, the hover class has activated over here. Now I can debug and find out what's being activated on the hover class. So that's over here. Now I can see, click, and I turn it on. Now I know that there is a hover style being applied that makes the background color transparent. So another thing that uh, people don't realize is that they look at all this uh, CSS code and say, wow, a lot of overriding. I don't know what is finally applied. So you can actually look at the computed uh, CSS class. And let's say like if you want to find out what is the font, font being applied to this button, for example, you can just search font family and we can expand it and just see that, okay, this uh, being applied open sense and there are other um, built-in style sheets as well that is um, given by your browser, your operating system. But now we know that this final class that uh, open says uh, open sense sense is uh, given by uh, this CSS style over here. So we can actually jump to that line. Okay, so let me go back for a bit. Now there's also a lot of interesting things you can do uh, when you want to debug what is happening on the UI. So let's uh, try to one of the things that uh, we want to check out is. Um, what happens when the UI changes and we want to capture what's happening over there? So what you can do is, let's, let's, uh, let's, we have this element that is changing over here. So there's this interesting thing that you can do that is to um, break on. So you can set something called DOM break points. So you can see over here DOM break points, but you can also do it over here as well. You can, there's a few ways you can break on, uh, set these breakpoints. You can set subtree modification breakpoint, which means that if anything, uh, element has changed um, inside that subtree, 
uh, you the your your debugger will activate and it will tell you which line in JavaScript that has stopped. Or otherwise, when your attribute has changed, uh, it will do the same thing. Or even when the node itself, the element has been taken away, you can trace it down to that specific line of JavaScript that removed your Java, uh, your your DOM uh, element itself. So you can do subtree modification and just give it a few seconds. Then we can see uh, a few seconds more. Now we can see that it hasn't changed. It hasn't changed to the new text yet. But now we know that this, this is where the line of code came. And now we can look at the call stack as well. So it's doing append class, and this is all the work that is being done by the view framework itself. So if you want to look at the actual code that our developers wrote, uh, we can go into here, it's the app navigation.view. Now we know that there is a, um, a code here that says rotate the call to action button with an interval of 10 seconds. So this is uh, how you can set DOM breakpoints over there. So I'm going to just remove that DOM breakpoint because uh, it will just activate every 10 seconds, which is quite annoying. Mm. Let me remove this, take this away. So there's a lot of things you can do. Uh, there's actually something that I realize a lot of uh, junior developers also don't know how to do is uh, how do I um, grab an element and put it on my console log. So there's a few ways you can do this. You can actually, uh, if, you know, no, if you're very familiar and comfortable with um, creating uh, CSS selectors, uh, if that's the ID, you can use that. But there's another way as well. You can just copy your XPath. So XPath is just the relative path of your, your uh, piece of element inside the X XML uh, document file. So over here, this is HTML. So with uh, your XPath that I just copied, what you can do is you can do $x. So $x is an XPath evaluator that is only there in, I think only supported in Chrome and Firefox. So you could do XPath, and I'll just paste in the navigation bar, uh, the, the, CSS, the XPath to the navigation bar, and I could print it out, and I get my element that is inside my debugger now, and I can do more stuff with it, like, okay, what is the, the uh, click action, for example? I just try to click on it. Yeah, so this is uh, how you can transfer things from the, the whatever you see on the elements page on your DOM and print it out into the console. So there's way more that things you can do uh, over in source. So you can look at your, um, you can look at uh, setting up uh, event listener breakpoints as well as well as uh, global listener breakpoints. So event listener breakpoints are very uh, useful. Let's say if you want to figure out uh, some of these things that you don't really know what, well where it's coming from, like you could have. Uh, added a lot of uh, handlers on this particular event, for example. So I'm going to just put one on message worker, so just to see what happens, what, what happens when we trigger a message uh, worker, uh, a message event itself, and what is the Java classes that are listening to it. So you could just put try it over here. So this, this over here is an iframe. And what we do, uh, iframe is basically another, uh, uh, is in its own isolated box and is trying to send a message up to the main application to trigger the test. So now we, ha we have stopped the debugger and we can trace it again to see, okay, what is uh, calling this, um, what is triggering it and what is receiving it. So you can just let it go and run it. So it's not just this, uh, let me just get rid of this debugger again. Ah, come on. Aya. 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 I just realized I am not on Wi Fi. <laughs> okay. So, anyway, uh, another thing you can do is. Okay, do I have Wi Fi? Yes. Okay, never mind. I'll figure it out later. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, if you want to do um, XHR breakpoints, you can also break on a specific uh, breakpoints. So, you can just say, like, I want to break on the URLs that contain snippets, or I could just say I want to break on URLs that say save, for example. Then I could just uh, click on the save button, and it should trigger, aha, uh, request.send, and we could just trace it back to which, which, uh, you, uh, which functions that are triggering. So we are passing through uh, XDORs, which triggers the XHR request, uh, which is uh, being triggered actually by the script editor, which runs the save function itself. So this is how you can capture all the uh, nitty gritty asynchronous uh, events that are flying around in your UI. Yeah. You have to connect to your 
Yeah, actually I'm pretty much done. Yeah. Okay. So that that's basically how to debug your front end. Yeah. Okay, so I'll leave it to um Jiaming who will tell you how to debug your back end. Okay. Uh don't, don't block off first. So uh any questions slide that we have? Oh slides. Have. slides. Yeah, so basically what I'll be touching on for the back end stuff will be how to how to use the postman. Have any one of you all heard what is postman? Yeah, so it's a lovely tool that I'll just covering the basics on the postman as well as working on the Java debugger on IntelliJ. Alright? So yeah, so just demo. The mic. Alright, so welcome to Postman. Um, Postman, is, Postman did not sponsor us, but I use it because I like, I like the interface and how easy it is to use, uh, especially when debugging an uh, API, uh, API backend that you have. All right. So as for Postman, there are several things other than, rather than just getting all the posts, all the methods that you can see over here. Uh, let me just zoom it in. Other than all the methods that you are able to uh, create via the Postman over here, you are able to do much more stuff, uh, as well as intercepting, which I will be touch, touching on later on. Okay. So firstly, I want to tell you all about how Postman, the environment of Postman is, whereby as you can see over here, you can, what Postman is good about is that you can create a lot of workspace. So what does workspace means is that example, over here I have my environment workspace. This can contain the whole project that I have currently, and if I want to switch it as accordingly as when I want to, I can just change it accordingly. All right? So you can create several workspace for each of your individual project that you can work on and create test cases in it as well. All right? So let me just go to the environment. What does uh, this particular workspace does is that uh, Postman actually can allow you to import some pre predefined variables inside your class, uh, inside your um, environment. Basically, it's just environment. All right. So what I can show you is that you can click on this particular one. Mm, oh. Okay. So all the name and description and things like that. Okay. For your env environment variables, what you can do is that you can actually declare all these variables within um, the workspace itself, um, or what Postman called a collection. So you can declare as a name example. Or can fool, bah. Okay, so things like this. And once you update it, is that later on you are able to use it. Example, um, where's my value? Yeah. Okay. So rather than just declaring the specific um string, a uh, predefined string that you have, you can actually make it dynamic by using the variables within the collection itself. All right, and you can uh, use it by using the two curly bracket as such as shown. And what you can see right is that if I were to send this out. There's something wrong. Let me oh over here. Mm, publish collection. Oh, okay. So if I go to the collection runner, so this particular test is that the environment variables that you have is specially made for the runners, the the runners of Postman. So selecting the collection that you have, example, what I see previously, I like using the data files. You can actually select the environments. Okay, and you can run it. What it does is that it will run test cases that you have defined within the Postman itself, and then to tell you that, hey, what is going, actually going on. So you can actually use Postman to have a set of test cases that you have already defined within the Postman, and then after that, to, um, to execute it such that if any of these test cases fail, you can know that your particular endpoint has passed or there's any errors that is ongoing over there. All right, so given to this post request, if you have multiple post requests within this particular collection, what you can see that Postman actually execute all these requests one by one. Within it, you can expand more and see that there are the request headers within the request that has just been made, as well as what is the request body, as well as the response, response header, and last but not least will be the response body, as seen over here. All right. So um, with that as well, let me just go over to this particular one of creating tests. Okay, so within a Postman environment, on I just show you an example. Later on, I'll show you another one where using my phone demo. So creating a test cases is as simple as just setting the environment, em, environment variables within it. Okay, 
So uh, just stay note of this one. I'll be moving on to the phone demo. So I have this particular API service, or it's a phone service whereby you can add numbers and you can delete numbers, just a simple service that you can just create. So what it does is that I have created four services within it. Uh, let me run the server. Okay. All right. So if you have given a batch, when you are saving a particular test, uh, what? When you are saving a particular test, test script uh, or what, a request within the Postman, you can also save the body type of this particular request that you have just made. So if I were to send it, uh, my API service will have a response that you can see at the bottom over here saying that all phones has been added. All right? And you can change accordingly to what are the um, variables that you want to enter input inside here in terms of form data using your ads, uh, this form URL encoded as well as giving up your binary files, uploading files, it can also be done within the Postman itself. Okay? So this is extremely useful when you are trying to just debug the API rather than just going through the UI and clicking on the buttons. Okay? So as you can see over here, I have an API service that call batch adding, adding these all sorts of um, phone numbers into my currently in-memory cache. I can have also another API endpoint that I've created, which is adding a single uh, number. Oh. Okay, which is over here as well. Okay, so now that I have, uh, let me create all this. Okay, I have this particular API endpoint called listing of phones. All right, what it does is that it, it is a post request that will take in a particular mode that you have called mode equals to object. So if I were to send this particular request over to my server, as you can see that this is the response that I received. Now, over here, you can see that the numbers are actually a little, a little bit weird whereby there are some plus 65 at the front and 65 at the back. This is also considered as a logic error that exists within our project. So it's time for debugging. Okay, moving on to here, you can see that there's a lot of console log that's ongoing. Um, I'll be debugging using the IntelliJ as well. So in order for you to, there are many ways of uh, running the debugger. One of the ways that I like is to do uh, using the debug mode, all right? So by using, running the project as a jar file, and I can activate a debug, uh, create a debug endpoint for my IntelliJ debugger to listen on to. And what I can do next, right, as you can see at the bottom over here, there's this debug option that you can select to, and you can attach the local, uh, the whatever local processors that is running the debug mode and connect to it, okay? So now I'm connected to my server already. Let me run the test cases again. Uh, okay, at this point of time, I can also set up points inside the uh, file itself, the class, uh, Java class file itself, to indicate that where, where, should the, where should the breakpoint be. I'll be touching on a few of them. Uh, one is called the breakpoint, and the one is called the conditional breakpoint. Inside IntelliJ, so we can first try to apply, we can try to apply what we have learned previously inside the, uh, inside the slides, whereby we try to identify the problem. Okay, as you can see, right, when I try to add this particular phone number, everything is added successfully, as you can see over here. However, it is only on the portion whereby I'm trying to display the list of phones out that there's some issue with printing. Oops, that is printing out the numbers that is within it. Okay, I can try to limit, try to limit the exact problem and try to simplify it by looking through by looking through a source code which I already know. So what happens is that we can see here that all the all the source code that is adding, whether is it adding multiple numbers or adding a singular numbers, is all going through this particular method called add phone. Add phone has this particular process, uh, have this particular function called add default locale. As you can see over here, what we can do is that we can actually click on the uh, click on the line number at the side of the editor, and you can say that if it runs over here, it will actually stop it there. So now, when I make a request once again, when adding a phone number. Let me send, uh, and it automatically switched to here, saying that there's, uh, you have indicated a break point and I shall be stopping here in any moment. Now, where do I carry on? So, IntelliJ, the interface for debugging mode, has several different options for you to select. All right? The first one that will be introduced will be a, what you will be commonly used, will be called a step over. Step over represents that when I click on the step over point, 
it will actually go on to the next step of the of the code inside your inside your editor. Okay. Sorry, at the at the foot. Yeah. So step by doing step over, you are actually stepping over each step of the code within your actual source code itself. So you can see exactly what is going on. And then within it, you can also see what are the uh, actual variables that exist within the source code itself. So this is live. And what you can do is that there's this particular thing. If in, in any case whereby you are unable to determine what is the true and false value or in any expression that you like to have, there's this calculator-like symbol over here, which is called evaluate expression. What you can do is that once you click onto it, a pop-up box will appear, and you can actually evaluate any expression that you like within or whatever, whatever conditions that you want to. So as you can see over here, if I will just, just press enter, the result that was shown over here is, it will tell me that the result is a particular eight digit number. Okay, nothing suspicious with it. All right, so we can carry on with the code of stepping over into the next one. Now, actually over here, it already tell you what is actually going on. Okay, over at line 86, this particular phone number is actually concatenating a plus six five, a plus six five to the phone itself. Hence, when evaluating to the actual phone number, it will actually just append it to the back of the, of the string. And the way to solve it is just to simply remove it, and then instead of putting it at the front, I will just plus the phone number at the back. Of course, you have to recompile it and do otherwise. All right? So this is one of the ways that you can do to identify what is the exact issue that you have using the IntelliJ debugger. Okay? So carry on next. <sighs> Okay, so now that we know what is going on already, what we can do is that we can actually press the resume program because we have already identified the problem that exists. So once, once we press resume program, and if we were to go back, we can see that the number has already been added. Okay, now, now that we know the um, problem, we will def definitely know that in order for us to deploy it to the production, definitely there will be test cases that need to be created. All right, so likewise for this particular small project that I have, we also have our own test cases over here. All right, call the add phone. Okay, so add phone, the particular programmer says that everything is fine, just do it and always do system operating line, which is wrong. What is actually comparing, right, is that it's just taking the new phone number, uh, establish a new instance variable and adding the phone inside. Within it, it will check whether the results is, uh, actually there's a lot of, things wrong within this test code, but the programmer deemed that it's perfect, perfectly fine and just go on with it. So nothing is wrong with production. We can push this piece of code to the production and nothing will happen, all right? So we have to actually edit it. So now, let us change. Over here, instead of comparing the result phone to the result phone itself, we should actually compare what we expected together with the phone, uh, we, together with the expected result. So. Instead of getting results, I will just do this. And over here, as you can see, not to waste time, I have just commented it out. So actually, the expected result should be, the default locale should be at the front of the phone number, comparing to the results at the, uh, when the results is being made, handed at the back, all right? So now that we have fixed it, let us, let us do this. And also over here, uh, expected result. Okay, um, now let us close the program, stop the debugger, we can exit it. And I'm using Gradle, Gradle Build to build it. So if you are using any other um, frame, framework, uh, MVM, uh, that one will be another topic on its own. Now, it says that it has failed. Why? So what we can see is that we can actually convert over to the test file that we have. And then open up, uh, person two, and go over to the file. Okay, so adding a test phone. Over here, it was expected to be called, but was, it's, actually a phone, uh, it's actually a number. So meaning that there are other problems within the code itself uh, that supposed to not occur, but it has happened. So let's just go over to what is going on. And inside the debugger phone here. Oops. So let me just go through the phone. Of the phone number. Okay, so now uh, if we were to just to go through by the code itself, I shall not dwell more on it. So we have this particular model. In this model, we have 
the constructor taking in the phone number and the name. All right. So, however, inside our test cases, what it does is that it's actually giving the where is that uh, phone number and the name, phone number and the name, getting the name. Wait a minute. Oops. Yep. So when you are tracing in the particular errors that you have over here, you can actually eventually trace back what is actually going on. So as you can see, if you were to trace it back to the top over here at the third line, it says that at line number 50, the DOA test is actually wrong. So what we can do is that we can go back to the IntelliJ over here and go to line number 50 at this point of time. The result phone get name is actually wrong. So if you were to head over to the phone DAO over here and see what is going on, uh, where is that particular phone? Okay, over at this particular line of line number 55, it's actually doing the wrong thing. It's adding the name first followed by the phone number. So what we could change is to just swap over the position and then to rerun the test again. And it should pass, oh no. Okay, so it says that the JSON path is not found. Okay, that is something, something very weird that is ongoing on. Okay, so now moving on next is that they say that, hey, actually at line number 57, there's, there's a trap that I set for myself, which I've apparently stepped into the trap. Okay, over at line number 57 of this particular phone controller test, I also have another error, which if I were to take a look at it, it says that because it's expecting a phone number, it should not be James, it should be otherwise. As the document has said, I hate writing tests. So now we can see that over here we add a phone number of 99. So if I were to search for a phone number that ends with 99, it should appear. Uh, let me see over at the 99, phone value should be 99999. Okay, and to run it again, and hopefully nothing fail, and we can carry on with our lives because that's the end of. <laughs> 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 Oh God, okay, uh, there's still something wrong because of this particular line over here. There is something wrong, but it's not my fault, okay? It's not my fault. It's the programmer that did this particular code, okay? So if you were to go and do the list, change... Yes, I didn't write this code. This is not what I write, okay? So if you were to go and build it again, and let's see what is going on. Uh, oi. Huh? It still failed. Okay, so if there's still something failed, we have to go and dig onto it to as explicitly know what is going on with the code. Um, well, at this point of time, code 99 and ends with do 99 expected status. Phone is that. And we can go on and check out our test case again. Over here, the phone is done. Now, ends with. So, oh, because what happened is that when we are adding just the number itself, our default locale actually adds in to be add in the default locale of plus 65. So what we actually need to do is that instead of expecting a plus six nine, we have to uh, plus nine 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 nine. We have to add in the plus six five at the front. Now going back to the previous one, that have there's another issue. Also the same thing whereby it's expecting plus six five. So if we were to resolve this, and now moment of truth, can it pass? And yes, everything passed. Nice. Okay. So if we do that, and then we run the test case again. Oops, uh, Java, <laughs> Java. All right, and everything works fine and we can go in our merry way of adding the phone numbers. Over here, phone numbers added and listing on the phone. Okay, uh, with that, I hope that it's not very confusing, but the basic gist of using the IntelliJ is that if you were to run it, have this particular debug mode that you have, to go and aid in your debugging in the future when you are doing your API test cases. All right, so let me switch back. How about documentation? Oh, documentation, <laughs> come. I shall show you what is good documentation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so documentation one is very easy. Definitely, definitely is not this. Yes, all right, this is not a good way of doing documentation. So how would I normally document my code, right? is that, okay, after you run the particular test case that you have, you know that, hey, there's this particular problem with this test case. So in IntelliJ, you can actually do, oops. Okay, in IntelliJ, you can just do the double star over here, 
And what I will norm, usually, usually do, right, is to add in the description of what this particular test case is going to write about. All right, so testing of the phone number, adding the phone number, just in uh, simple English and short English is what I would prefer. Yeah, not too long. And usually when I do documentation, I will also normally do it in point form rather than just doing in large chunks of paragraph. Adding the phone number. Something like that. All right. However, within your code itself, right, what I will usually like to do is that within the code, to also segregate each portion of what you have, uh, each of segregate each of the function that you have. Example, in this particular uh, DAO, data access object, I will divide this particular code with four different types of crew operation, which is basically the create, read, update, and delete. So I will just name that as accordingly, so that the next developer that comes to develop this particular, to work on this piece of class, will have a better time in figuring out which are the exact segregation within the code itself. Okay? So, and with that, and going here. Yes. Then you want to go next. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you, Jiaming. That was a very good job on how to debug your back end and fix bugs and test it and to fix it. <laughs> okay, so you figure out what's the bug. How do you, what's the post-mortem? You, after you fix it, you write your test, you test it in staging, so that it's not a, it works on my machine, kind of thing. Yeah, test it on staging, or if it works, then deploy to production. Make sure you document what happened, so that the next guy who comes by and say, hey, what's this code doing here? Delete it, like, it's redundant and stuff like that. So you wanna make sure that you document it, and if it's interesting enough, write a blog about it. Yep, okay, so that's all. Thank you. Thank you.